right into this and introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Robert Stanton. Dr. Robert Stanton is really, I, I think, one of the most knowledgeable and remarkable surgeons in, in fibrous dysplasia. He's been doing this for many years. Uh, he's our go-to guy all the time. Uh, He's been very supportive. He sends us research specimens, which is huge. So with no further ado, he will speak to you about pediatric issues related to fibroids. All right, so I have been doing this a long time. Uh, I like to say that um, when I started, um, Mike had uh, hair that wasn't gray, and, and I actually had hair. Um, and I don't think Allison was even born. So, uh, <laughs> now be because they're filming this, I'm tied to the lectern, and I'm, I'm a kind of a nervous guy. I like to move around a lot, so I'll, 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 I'll do my best. I'll do my best to stay in one place. And uh, I noticed yesterday some people were having trouble hearing in the back of the room, so I tend to speak pretty loud, so I don't think that'll be a problem, okay? All right, so let's see if I can make the magic work here. Um, so um, I started this uh, in the late 70s and the early 80s, and it was one of those things where um, when you're a young surgeon, you try to go to the literature and see what's been written. And unfortunately, polyostotic fibrous dysplasia did not appear in the literature very much, uh, part of, partly, I guess, because, A, it's a rare disease. Number two is that uh, to write an article, you need to collect enough people to do statistics, and that's kind of hard to do uh, since it's a rare disease. And secondly, I think most importantly, you'll hear over and over, every one of the patients is different, are not the same. Some are mildly involved, uh, some are severely involved, and what works for one person is not going to work for another person. It makes it very, very hard to publish anything. So there was very little written ex uh, experience, and uh, most of the patients are treated by tumor surgeons because, you know, peripherally it's a tumor. Um, I don't know if that's exactly right. It, uh, in any case, the tumor surgeons tend to be adult-oriented um, surgeons at most universities and medical centers, with uh, very few tumor surgeons having a feel for children. And uh, everything I'm going to talk about today, basically, is, is toward children. So, A, I want to know who is here as an adult because of their own disease. Raise your hands. Okay, now, down. Now, who is here because they're, they're trying to get information about either or their child or somebody else's child? Okay, well, that's an, all right. And then the last thing, how many of you have heard me talk before? Yeah, I'm going to apologize to you guys, okay? The apology is because you're going to see slides here that may have appeared for seven or eight years, and that's a failure on our part as scientists and surgeons. Um, we're not making great progress on the surgical management of this condition, and not much has changed in the last seven or eight years. In the last 15 years, yes, there's been some important stuff, but, but recently only a few things have changed, and I'll point some of those out, and, and there's a lot of repetition here, and I will probably cover some stuff that Lynn wants to talk about, and I'll try not to step on his toes too much. So um, grateful patients and the cooperation of the NIH has funneled a lot of patients to me over the years so that I have uh, learned a lot and I have, getting, I, I have been getting more and more patients. Some of them are what I call my email patients that I don't actually take care of. But I, I'm very free with my advice. Uh, you ask for an opinion and you'll get it. Whether you think it's worth anything and whether your doctor thinks it's worth anything is a completely separate question. So I've been doing this for at least 37 years, maybe more, and, and I have learned what does not work. And I think that's very important. I, I see a lot of emails coming in, well, my doctor wants to do X, Y, and Z on my four-year-old. And I think, oh my God, that's not going to work. And then I have to think of a tactful way of passing along that information in a way that it will do some good. So um, we all know about this uh, condition. We're not going to talk about all the details. The extent of disease, parents are always asking me, well, you know, how do I know how bad this is going to get? How do I know w what bones are going to be involved? And Mike's already talked about this. And, and the bone scan is 
is important and there are in my opinion no new areas there's just tiny little areas that we didn't know you had and then as you get older those areas increase in size to the point where they're detectable and and this is work that Mike and the people at NIH have done over the years that I didn't do but it helped me and I have patients all the time that whose kids are two years old and somebody wants to get a bone scan and I'm saying well it's not really going to help it's not going to do any good um, so the orthopedic literature is very limited and there is still a lot of stuff in there on monostatic poly uh, 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 fibrous dysplasia, monostatic fibrous dysplasia. And it is uh, biologically and, and um, histologically uh, not the same. The, the, if you do the genetic studies on monostatic disease, I'm, I've been told that the mutations are the same. But for no one can quite explain to me the monostatic patients with one bone involved. The disease is aggressive. It, it, it doesn't cause severe problems, and it's relatively simple to take care of. The deformities are minimal, and fairly standard conventional orthopedic techniques seem to work quite well. Uh, scrape it out, uh, put in a plate, uh, in a fibula like this little bone here, you can actually just take out that segment of the fibula and put in a little bit of bone graft that will re regenerate. That, that patient is so easy to take care of it and funny compared to the polyostatic patients. So a lot of pa uh, surgeons who don't know much about this will go to the literature and they'll read a few articles on monostatic disease um, and they'll think, well, this is easy and, and it's just not. So just to remind you of what the normal upper femur should look like because that's where most of the trouble is occurring is in the upper femur. Other places are not that challenging. And over the years I have struggled with figuring out how can I support and correct upper femur disease. So in polystatic fibrous dysplasia, the patient's upper femurs um, are terrible. They tend to be, um, um, they tend to sustain very early deformity. And that's a, another key point that we'll talk about in a minute. The disease is very aggressive. The deformity shows up early, and you have to get after it early. In, in some cases, um, the deformity uh, can take some very unusual uh, patterns, such as this very, very badly deformed pelvis. The bones are thin and weak. and uh, are they breaking and then angulating and then healing in the angled position? Or is it a slow bend? Is the, is the bone bending? It's all a matter of semantics. Is it a thousand small fractures? Or is it just the bone is bending? I don't think we really understand that completely. But the deformity is, is bad if you don't attack it early. So some of the things I know that don't work, and you've heard, some of you have heard these before. I used to try to scrape out the fibrous dysplasia um, and replace it with bone grafting. Uh, and that does not work. Uh, you can put really, really dense bone grafts in, and within a few months, the grafts are gone. The, the, the process somehow eats away the bone grafts. So that does not work. Secondly, I will say also, when you try to take out this disease, there's a lot of blood loss. The disease is very, very vascular. Um, doing extensive surgery on um, children or adults uh, can lead to the need for uh, blood transfusions, which I'm very much against. Are there exceptions? Yes. Um, there are places for bone grafts. I'll talk about those in a minute. Don't allow the deformity to get bad. Coming back from bad deformity is so hard that attacking it when it's relatively mild before it gets bad, that you should, you should always strive to do that. I used to say, don't use plates or screws at all. And I don't say that anymore. There are some uh, excellent new locking plates and screws that are very helpful in this disease, but always remembering that, in general, plates and screws are temporary. They, they can achieve short-term goals, but whenever possible, devices that go down the center of the bone, intramedullary devices, are the best um, cure for the problem. However, they are almost universally not available in the sizes we need for small children. And a single operation is never going to solve the problem 
for almost every patient, okay? If you have one operation and reach adulthood, you're very, very lucky. So the bone deformity is progressive over time, and we can manage it. I, we cannot permanently cure deformity. We can manage it and, and manage it again and manage it again. Why is that? The, the growth hormone makes the bones a tr a grow, and growth hormones doesn't make uh, any of your muscles and tendons get longer. So how do they get longer? The bone grows, and then you stretch. Well, if your bones are very weak, the muscles are stronger than the bone, and that's part of the deforming forces. It, it, the body is trying to grow against very strong muscles and tendons, and the bone is weak. So when do I operate? Well, I used to do a lot of this, and, and I was discussing that with mom a minute ago. Indications for surgery. Well, if you have persistent weight-bearing bone pain, and, and it's, it's very debilitating, it's affecting your life in bad ways, then uh, placing intramedullary rods or fixation devices in a bone that isn't necessarily badly deformed may help in controlling weight-bearing bone pain. And I used to do a lot of surgery for this, but the endocrinology people have gotten so good at figuring out why these bones are, are not as good as they might be that I don't do that very much anymore. Reversing deformity, of course, and um, trying to prevent it in the first place is the main current indication for surgery. Frequent fractures. Sometimes bones aren't badly deformed, but they break all the time. And if you're in a, a, an arm cast three or four times every single year because your arm keeps breaking, you need an operation. Right. How many fractures do you have to have in a year? That's a personal choice. <coughs> Two may not be so bad. Three's getting me worried and four's too much. Uh, that's my opinion as a surgeon and as a father. I don't know, uh, every parent has to make up those uh, uh, decisions on their own. So um, no surgery until the medical management is, is optimal, okay? Um, we used to see a fair amount of rickets. I don't think we see too much of that anymore. And, and of course the bisphosphonates have helped a lot for many people in helping to control weight-bearing bone pain. And uh, as was mentioned yesterday, we haven't seen that it diminishes the frequency of fractures and we have not seen that it diminishes the progression of deformity, but it has helped a lot of people with bone pain. Um, some of the children that are very badly involved need surgery as often as every year and a half to two years, which is kind of depressing, but um, if, you're, if you're ready for it and you understand what, what the goals are, um, then um, most families can understand that. So after surgery, I try to get people up walking as quickly as possible, where, uh, if not walking, at least standing. Um, I avoid casting when possible, but unfortunately sometimes the fixation devices are just trying to hold very, very weak bone and a cast is necessary. But the shortest amount of time in a cast, whenever possible, and if it's a cast that, that could be uh, stood up where the patient can be standing in a cast, that's helpful. Uh, a lot of my patients come from far away and they have to travel and if they're in a standing cast it's very difficult to travel. You can't get on a plane and even um, safely strapping a person into a van or a car for a long trip is difficult. So some of my patients do go home in sitting casts. Minimizing bed rest, very important. So what have I learned? Well, I already mentioned uh, almost no bone grafting. I'll tell you, there's a couple exceptions. More intramedullary rods and early, early surgery for femur deformity. Doing nothing is a, a bad choice. And this is a, a picture of a three-year-old and then at age 12. And uh, no surgery has ever been done on that child. And the upper femurs on both sides are badly deformed. And I don't think that's a recoverable deformity. I really don't think that in practical, uh, there's no practical surgery that can recover from that amount of deformity. So that's a patient who can stand for transfers, but, but can't walk and uses a wheelchair all the time. So children's bones are small and the growth plates are open. The growth plates at the upper and lower ends of each of the bones that makes the bones grow longer. And many of the conventional devices that we use for fixation uh, are not meant to cross growth plates because you can mess up the growth of the bone. So um, I often use uh, unusual stuff. And uh, so this is just an example of a device that was designed for humerus fractures in adults. 
and so it comes in small sizes because the humerus bone is pretty small and I can put that in a femur if I want to uh, it's I'm legally allowed to do that it's not designed for that it's not FDA approved for insertion in that bone but I'm allowed to do that on individual patients I just can't get up in a group of doctors and recommend that they do it so I use devices in the wrong bone whenever it seems to me like that's the best fit. And the insertion techniques sometimes have to be um, invented to not cross growth plates. So the, uh, there are some new devices, but they're somewhat limited. The orthopediatrics company uh, is very exciting um, to me because they're dedicated just to children. And they make devices just for children. And uh, just three weeks ago, I had a long meeting with a bunch of engineers from their company. And we're, we're brainstorming, trying to come up with an intramedullary uh, rod for the femur in children that will be the right size and have the right angles, which none of them have right now. I used to get devices um, from the Orient. Most of the companies like Zimmer and Synthes make devices uh, that they sell in the Orient for you know, very, very small Oriental people. And I used to get those and use those. Um, but when the companies found out I was bringing them in from out of the country, they got on my case and I can't do that anymore. So uh, sometimes uh, you run afoul of the regulations and uh, I don't want to end up in jail. So, um, so the hands and feet, um, you know, they're not technically very difficult, but you know, every step you take, you're walking on your feet and, and the hand is the most important part of the body. Okay, so hands and feet. Well, they rarely need surgery, but some of our patients have an awful lot of, of uh, fibrous dysplasia in their feet bones and their hand bones. And uh, if you have fractures that are frequent, bone grafting for the little bones in the hands and feet works pretty well. And that is basically, in my opinion, the only time you, can, you should consider bone graft. Uh, tibias are pretty simple. Uh, you know, just about anything you put in a tibia will work. These are uh, some old rush rods that I, I'm not even sure they make them anymore, but most hospitals have them down in the basement. And uh, they're pretty stiff and they work pretty well. Uh, you can use uh, flexible titanium rods, which are newer, and I use those a lot. Uh, some of the very small children I've seen from other uh, places have just had a thin thing called a Kirshner wire put in, and that also works. It, it, it doesn't take much. You do a corrective osteotomy to correct the curvature and you put a rod down the middle of the bone and it seems to work pretty well. The, um, it stops the fractures from being so frequent and if you do get a fracture it keeps the bone from getting crooked while you're waiting for it to heal. Um, uh, sometimes I'll rod tibias just because they hurt with, with walking. Um, there's lots of different rods um, and as the children get uh, older you can use um, just about any, there's lots of them available. That's not really a challenge. It's the femur where we have all of our trouble, okay? In mature patients, you can put a regular intramedullary rod that's designed for an adult. Uh, and how mature? Well, around two years uh, after the onset of the menstrual periods. Well, okay, well, does that apply to precocious puberty? <laughs> I, I don't know yet, okay? Uh, we, usually if you, you hit the growth plate, Within two years of when it's going to stop growing anyway, you're, you're safe. But um, this is an unsolved problem for some of us. All right, just, just to remember what the, uh, what the normal femur is supposed to look like, the normal angle at the top. All right, and when it, when it looks like this, it's very difficult to figure out what to do. These are very, very challenging. And not, not every one of these fixation devices are ones that I personally placed. I do inherit a lot of patients who have had things done already. Uh, but some of this I will take credit for. Um, it's the most frequent and the earliest deformity and the most difficult reconstruction. So um, the femoral neck in an older patient is pretty easy to take care of. Uh, they do make some very nice reconstruction rods that work pretty well for older patients. The normal angle is 135. In fibrous dysplasia, the angle decreases as you've seen before. And reversing deformity is very difficult. So I recommend surgery early. Uh, in older patients, it's, it's it, pretty simple to take care of this stuff. Um, the standard techniques. Um, in younger patients, um, you have to make things up and operate a lot. And as the femoral neck gets uh, weak, the, the fixation devices can cut out over time. And when they cut out, you have to take them out. You have to redo your corrective osteotomy. And then uh, I inherit patients who have had things done that, that 
other people think probably will work, but their logic and their knowledge of fibrous dysplasia is lacking. Flexible rods are okay for the shaft of the femur. And the flexible rods you see on that left side are titanium or sometimes stainless steel flexible rods. And they're good for the shaft, but they do not support the neck of the femur. Fossier de all rods, which you see on the patient's left or your right, that is an expandable rod made for children with osteogenesis imperfecta who don't get into neck shaft angle problems very often, but get shaft fractures. So that rod uh, is placed in a way that allows the inner rod to slide out of the outer rod and it will expand. Except in fibrous dysplasia, the bone keeps trying to bend and when that system starts getting bent, then it binds and the two rods will not telescope anymore. And secondly, it doesn't support the femoral neck. So an inventive surgeon here uh, put these little wires up into the neck and then wrapped another wire around the fossier de all rod trying to make an acceptable femoral fixation device. And of course that didn't work and the wires cut out and penetrated the, the, the neck and had to be replaced. So I've used a few of these. This is a rod from Canada that was very, very promising. It, it comes in nice small sizes and I've used a few of these. It's not uh, too bad, it's called GAP, G-A-P, a GAP rod. But I've had um, two of these break uh, fairly quickly after they were in, less than a year. So I'm not totally sold on this particular rod. Um, that's one of the fractures, the rod fractures. Now, why, do, why, do, why does the metal fail? Well, all metal fails. If you take a coat hanger and start bending it back and forth a few times, it's going to break. And if you take one of these rods and you bend it about 15 or 20,000 times, it'll break. Okay. So the, all metal will break. So the whole idea behind the metal is it's supposed to share the load, not take the load. And the original intent of these rods is to fix fractures. And once the fracture heals, then theoretically the rod isn't seeing forces anymore. But in fibrous dysplasia, the rod has a continuing job to do, you know, week after week, month after month. And, and so fractures of the fixation devices are not unheard of in weak bone disease. The upper extremities, I do uh, rod those because in many of our patients, the upper extremity is a weight-bearing bone. They're using crutches or a walker, and it's carrying the patient's weight. So it's a weight-bearing bone. And if they have fractures or pain in a weight-bearing bone, I put rods in, and there's a bunch of very, very simple rods that work quite well. Casting for the infrequent fracture is, is fine. That works. <clears throat> and small intermedular rods if, if the fractures are frequent or if there's significant deformity. But actually, upper extremity deformity is not that common. So beware of the aneurysmal bone cyst. Um, you may have heard a little bit about this uh, bone cyst, aneurysmal bone cyst is a uh, fairly rapidly enlarging liquid-filled cyst with lots of blood flow uh, that uh, unfortunately has a tendency to occur as a degenerative process within fibrous dysplasia. It, it can occur in many, many other situations, but fibrous dysplasia seems to be a magnet for ABCs. And the ABC on the x-ray looks just a lot like regular fibrous dysplasia. It can be Excuse me. It can be very difficult to tell the difference between fibrous dysplasia and an aneurysmal bone cyst. In an x-ray that, that has been stable for a while and then suddenly a big loosened area shows up over a few months and the patient has a lot of pain, you have to be suspicious. Uh, it's easy to diagnose with an MRI, but most of the patients already have lots of metal in their body, which makes the MRI difficult to get. So um, uh, you have to be suspicious and... Um, if you have one, uh, I operate on those. And there's another exception to the rule of not using bone graft. I do graft aneurysmal bone cysts. Uh, why is that? Well, not because I think the bone graft's going to last, but because I want to replace the bone graft with fibrous dysplasia bone, which is better than liquid. Okay, As weak as fibrous dysplasia is, it's stronger than liquid. So I make the bone cyst go away, and then it's replaced with, with the fibrous dysplasia the patient had there before, and that seems to work pretty well. Uh, these are pretty common in the skull, too. I don't know how many of the patients that, that we're talking about have, 
have bad skull disease, but ABCs occur in the skull a lot. Um, neurosurgeons deal with those, obviously. So um, Lynn may have some thoughts on late reconstructions, and, and um, I, I've been asked a lot about those, but I, I don't have tons of experience. I, I did a few of these um, before I became exclusively a pediatric orthopedist. And late reconstructions use lots of metal and uh, giant allografts. So this is a, basically replaced 90% of this patient's femur with a piece of dead bone into which I cemented a bipolar prosthesis. And uh, it's a reconstruction for a, a young man that had uh, like nine or 10 operations over the years. And, uh, and basically his leg was, was a bag, piece of baggage that he was carrying around on crutches, it was useless. And this worked pretty well for him. And I actually got about 25 year follow up because a friend of his is an orthopedic surgeon that I know. Uh, in the Navy and said he was doing fine. So um, they're, they're never the first choice, but they may be a good salvage. Um, and um, you have to be careful because they do tend to be prone to infection, which can be a disaster. Um, okay, so um, I've got a, uh, we're gonna say a little bit about, about this, and that's, I'm gonna slip through most of these cases because we don't have time, we have five minutes, but, um, Allison and her colleagues have written a really nice paper about scoliosis in fibrous dysplasia. And as far as I know, unless I'm wrong, correct me, there isn't any article ever been published on scoliosis in fibrous dysplasia. And Allison has a really nice article that uh, we hope to get published pretty soon. So um, yes, people with fibrous dysplasia often have scoliosis and sometimes bad enough that it needs to be treated. And um, surprisingly, conventional methods work pretty well in the spine. Um, I'm going to just go to some of these, like there's a, a badly bowed tibia that's been corrected and rotted in a slightly older child. This is a patient with relatively mild disease that um, has one femur rotted and then we have here what's called uh, guided growth where the leg is crooked and if you put this tiny little plate and screws across one side of the growth plate while it's still open, the other side can grow and you can straighten out the leg over time. So if, if the patient's still growing, you can take advantage of growth to sometimes uh, correct some mild forms of deformity. And this is one of the cases where a patient uh, developed what we call now atypical fractures that are uh, starting to be seen in patients on bisphosphonates who are normal um, or basically older patients who don't have fibrous dysplasia, who are on bisphosphonates for osteopenia of, of aging. And the, this is a, um, what's called an atypical femur fracture that this young man developed requiring a correction and a rod. So um, there are some patients that, um, this is a, I think um, one of the things I learned from Ernesto Ippolito in, in Italy a few years ago. And he said, well, um, do a corrective osteotomy with a plate and screw device and then replace it later with an intermedullary rod. And, and that's all well and good except I don't have an intermedullary rod that's going to fit that femur. But I, I have found that if you tip the femoral head up much higher than it's supposed to be into an angle of 150 or better, that the patient uh, will last a lot longer before anything else has to be done. This is not the normal angle and there's a mild price to be paid with abductor weakness when you do this. But I think that's a good trade-off for a longer-lasting reconstruction. And I've been doing a lot more of these lately. Um, and then uh, eventually I hope to replace most of those with intermedullary rods. So uh, here's, here's one here with a gap nail on one side and uh, what I call a valgus osteotomy. First of two stages, re restored neck shaft angle or actually overcorrect it and then later replace with an intermedullary rod once we have one that's the right shape size. Right, so my final thoughts. Um, Surgery is not going to cure fibrous dysplasia. Now, these guys doing the research in the, in the laboratory, they're the ones that will finally come up with an answer. Until then, then, um, then I'll do the surgery to try to keep people walking. I don't think surgery is recommended often enough in children. And thanks to my partners who care for my patients when I'm here talking, and, and my patients and families. All right. Oh. Yeah. You need electronics. Oh, yeah.
Pardon? I think the seven yeah. got to be up. I think they asked me to give the talk on adults because I'm one of the few pediatric orthopedic surgeons who still works on old people too. But it may be because I it, it may be because I am an old person with fibrous di dysplasia. Uh, first, however, I have to give you my financial d declaration so that you're uh, assured that I'm not uh, up here pitching some product for some big corporation. You can just how do you advance here? The up and down button? That okay. Yeah, there we go. Here's my financial declarations. <laughs> when I <laughs> went to make this talk, there were several issues uh, I encountered. The first was I wasn't sure if we needed this talk. After all, we've all been told that once we're an adult and stop growing, the fibrous dysplasia stops and it'll heal up and we'll be fine as adults. However, apparently some of us didn't get the, um, the memo on this thing. The real difficulty in uh, making this talk uh, was, as Bob uh, alluded to, the number of different issues I saw people discussing on support groups and social media. The big one is the uniqueness of the individual. Everyone is different as far as the location of the deformity, the extent of the deformity, the extent of the uh, involvement, uh, what treatments they've had in, in the past, and also what medical care they actually have access to, whether in a rural area, foreign country, uh, by a major metropolitan medical center, uh, etc. Also, the nature of the adult I is changing. Those uh, old ones of us who had uh, management by curatage and grafting have a lot different residual than the new adults who are managed with the uh, what I call a realignment and reinforcement method. There also are a few adult discovery ones. The ones who the uh, fibrous dysplasia is picked up incidentally during adulthood for an x-ray for a sprained ankle or a car accident or, or something. But the only thing I can say about that is if your skeletal disease is uh, so mild it's only picked up incidentally in middle age, you're probably home free. I decided that the best way to cover all these permutations I was seeing and uh, get you uh, informed on what you have to do with your fibrous dysplasia as an adult was basically to go back to the basics. If you understand the basics, then you'll understand, if you understand how fibrous dysplasia affects bone, then you'll have a better understanding of what to expect in your situation and understand how your fibrous d dysplasia probably should be handled in your adult years. Going back to the basics, uh, we'll, again, here we're talking mainly about long bones, not uh, craniofacial. And again, uh, fibrous dysplasia in the bones is a mix of both normal and mutant cells, or disease cells. And the mutant cells have a growth ad advantage. They grow better or faster or more readily than, than normal bone cells. Anything that stimulates bone healing or bone growth will stimulate the fibrous dysplasia cells more than the normal cells. Growth a bone continues into adulthood. Our bones are constantly growing, remodeling to stresses, 
healing things. And such things as fractures will stimulate the bone growth and bone healing. Surgical trauma stimulate bone growth and bone healing. As well as just everyday wear and tear. Our bones are constantly re replacing. They're not a static structure like a, a wall. They are constantly remodeling and uh, reinforcing themselves due to stress. And so since bone growth continues in, into adulthood, we'd expect fibrous dysplasia to continue to be active into adulthood, just at a slower rate. So how will this affect us in our adult years is the main concern a lot of fo folks have. Well, in your adult years, fibrous dysplasia will continue to be a, a pain figuratively and literally. Uh, some call it a chronic pain. I actually consider it more of an acute recurrent pain. You'll have some days, weeks, maybe months with no pain. Suddenly, you'll get a flare-up of, of, of pain. I think that's a little different than the chronic pain we see in cancer patients or fibromyalgia or some of those other chronic painful things. The next is deformities will continue to progress. On the left is an x-ray from 89. On the right, you got the x-ray from 2005. I'll need to put this in my pocket so I can move a little bit. Let me grab my laser pointer here. <laughs> and if you notice where the trochanter is here in 89 versus in 2005, you can see that the distance from here to the acetabulum is greater here than here. It's literally shortening. If you look how the screws appear to have cut out, the screws don't cut out, they don't move. The femoral head is literally drifting off. Okay. That's how screws cut out. I think I'll need this a second again. Now, looking at the other end of the femur, notice here it is in 89 where the rod is with respect to the screw. Here it is, it's uh, in, uh, dead ended against the screw there. The femur, uh, the rod is now uh, pinned against the lateral edge of the femur. Again, the rod hasn't moved. The femur has bent and drifted over that way. Also, notice this area here, how the disease has gotten worse. The disease continues to grow and progress. How do you treat that? Let me have my bottle of water there. It's getting dry up here. Like everything else, the treatment and uh, prevention of the continued deformity is the realign and reinforce. The earlier, the better. A lot easier to realign that x-ray on the left is the x-ray on the right. It's easier to do it, get the uh, femoral neck and femoral head more vertical, and uh, so the getting it more vertical, it'll bear weight better, it'll deform less in the future, you get better re results. Also, uh, in the progressive deformity, here was an attempt to try and reinforce that neck. And in this x-ray, you can actually see a little crack still has developed in spite of an uh, attempt to reinforce the neck. Six months later, you notice that the head has drifted off further, the screw has actually broken now, and about two years later, in spite of non-weight bearing, crutches and stuff, it has continued to shorten. You look at the relationship of the rod to the acetabulum, it has shortened, continued to, to deform in spite of the fracture healing. The fracture healed, but it continued to deform to the point of this patient was actually an inch short on the right side and was still having pain because the deformity is going to continue to bend. The answer to that is to go ahead and realign it. See here we've gotten the neck up into a more of a normal angle. Uh, we'd like to have gotten it higher, but you're limited by the angle of these screws, which is fixed. Also, now, well, here, the weight was pushing down this way, a bending force. Here, we have a compressive force. Uh, bone is like concrete. It 
tolerates vertical loading real well this way. It doesn't handle bending, tension well. And so we want to get the bones vertical where the load is going down the bone like concrete. Uh, it handles the loading well. And like concrete, if we can't get it vertical, uh, or even if you do get it vertical, concrete still sometimes fails. Uh, for concrete, we put re uh, reinforcing rods in it, rebar. The same thing with the bone, we put reinforcing rods in it. And in this case, we got a couple of better screws up there to hold it. And uh, this, these screws are smooth here as they go through the rod, so they will allow the screws to slide as this uh, compresses to allow healing. <coughs> They'll slide out. And we actually got uh, the two and a half centimeters she was short, we actually got three back. So that gives us a little bit of extra room as the hip settles to still keep her the same length. And it isn't just in deformity. These x-rays are about two years uh, apart. We'd actually done a femur on this kid a couple years before. We knew he had the disease here, but now he's become painful. And if you look, it may not show up well here, the disease actually appears worse here just from everyday wear and tear and bone healing. The disease has gotten worse. So we just dropped the rod down it and it alleviated a lot of, or all of his pain. And I think it does it two ways. Uh, one, there may be micro fractures uh, in the bone that's causing pain. With the rod in there, the bone is strengthened so it doesn't break but it also gets rid of the fear of fracture. And this, I think, is what gives a lot of, uh, uh, especially adults, their chronic pain or their recurrent pain, is when you have pain in that leg, it usually portends some catastrophic uh, fracture, uh, you know, months off from work, uh, hospitalization, surgery, cast, as a major catastrophic event in your life. And so any little pain you get in that leg, it's the, oh my God, here it comes again. You get the same pain in the other leg where the body knows there's no chance of fracture, the body blows it off. So your mind is constantly focused on that limb. For those of you wearing glasses or a ring, until I mentioned it, you weren't aware of those. Now that I mentioned it, you can feel your glasses. You can feel how they're way on your nose, <laughs> feel on the back of the ears. And if I get enough attention turned to those glasses, they'll be so painful, you can't stand them. In <laughs> fact, if you take them off, you'll still feel them, okay? The same thing uh, with that pain, if we associate it with, oh my God, it's happening uh, again, uh, your, your mind is constantly on any little twinge of pain there, the pain will never go away. By putting the rod in, uh, your body becomes convinced, hey, it, if it hurts, nothing can happen. If it uh, breaks, it's rotted, okay? So it, we don't have to do anything. You'll have four to six weeks of some discomfort, maybe, but it's not gonna be a catastrophic interference in your life. So that's one of the real uh, benefits, I think, of rotting these non-bent bones is it makes them bulletproof. You can turn them loose, let them do what they want without the fear of having a catastrophic fracture. Now, arthritis. This can be due to the joint actually collapsing, crushing, uh, due to the fibrous <laughs> di dysplasia itself. It can also uh, be just arthritis in a normal joint where you have fibrous dysplasia in the surrounding bones, which does pose a bit of a problem to the reconstructive surgeon. In this case, if you look at the uh, x-ray from 2005, the femoral head is reasonably round, smooth, fairly decent joint space there. And to look at, the, again, the distance between the top of the rod and the acetabulum. Here it is in 2013. The bone has collapsed. It's actually shearing off. You look how much the shortening has gone on there. To realign and reinforce this isn't going to help the joint shot only answer is a total hip. Now, um, total hips are not in fibrous dysplasia are not without problems and complications. Um, I, after reading the 
research from the Mayo Clinic. I uh, vowed that the only way they were going to get me back to the operating room to do a total hip is to drag me kicking and screaming. That ended up being prophetic. Okay, I couldn't kick, but made up for it in screaming. Okay, uh, you have poor quality bone as a uh, putting total hips in. You like to have good hard bone to set that prosthesis in. In fibrous dysplasia, you may not have that. In addition, the size of the bone. So we like to have that prosthesis fitting nice and tight into the bone. Uh, in some of these bones, it's like putting a uh, pencil inside a coffee can. Okay, The prosthesis can move and settle. And with the movement of the prosthesis, you get stress concentration. The end of that prosthesis is now pushing hard on that bone and it will break it. And failure around the total hip and fibrous dysplasia has very limited salvage options. It's not like anything else. We just go in, put some plates on it and stuff like that, um, or it, change it out. Uh, you, may, you may not be able to, uh, to salvage that. That brings up one of the other issues that uh, is constantly brought up uh, on social media and recently on TV shows. If the bone is so bad, why do you just get rid of it, put metal in? Okay, sounds really nice, really uh, attractive. In the future, there may be some options for uh, total uh, bone re replacement, either with metal or synthetic of some sorts. Has, it's done more frequently in tumor patients uh, and has been done in fibrous di dysplasia. Um, it's a nice salvage for a failed total hip or the femur breaks or something, or there's nothing to put the, fe the femoral prosthesis into. Uh, it's an option when you have failed bone grafting. These people who've been bone grafted uh, 5, 10, 15 times, and it keeps getting worse. Eventually, there's nothing but tissue paper in there. Uh, and for those who just naturally have severe disease that is a, a possibility it has been done we don't do it frequently because the surgery itself is a real biggie and a lot of uh, the complications not only the usual surgery complications but uh, this is associated with a possibility of a fair amount of blood loss catastrophically and neurovascular injuries obviously but even if you get through all of that post-operatively the complications uh, the one everyone thinks of is in infection. The body gets rid of infection or keeps things clean by the bloodstream. It's constantly moving the white blood cells through. Think of it as a police horse roaming the streets. Uh, if there's some streets or back alleys where the police don't get, that's where the evildoers lurk. The same thing here. If you have places where the blood supply isn't getting inside of joints, metal the prostheses, uh, Th that's where the infections will seat, either immediately, uh, early after the operation, but also late. We're, all, we're constantly getting bacteria in our blood from brushing our teeth, scratching pimples, whatever, as well as invasive things like your colonoscopy or uh, in injections and things like that. And that, bac that bacteria can get settled onto the prosthesis, and you've got this huge, big metal thing in there with no blood flow through it, okay? And the bacteria will actually form a membrane, okay, on it to uh, protect themselves. And the only way you can get rid of that uh, infection is to take the metal out, okay? Then you got nothing left. So, realistically, that's a possibility. So late in infections, hematogenous seated in infections. And even if you avoid all that with these uh, uh, total bone re replacements, there's a, a fair amount of joint stiffness. The limb doesn't move. Now, I'd probably claim that having a limb that doesn't bend at the hip or the knee that you can stand on and wa walk on with a stiff leg probably is better than what you had, but it's, a, again, the proverbial long run for a short slide. Now, some people would keep asking about, well, how often should I be evaluated? Um, in my mind, anytime you're having symptoms, especially if they're new pains, new symptoms, or symptoms in an unprotected area. Uh, that kid was having uh, pain in his uh, lower leg, unprotected, that should be evaluated. Now that there's the rod in there, less likely. If there are any at-risk areas, 
the main one being the proximal femur, femoral neck. That's where the uh, problems are going to happen. Or if you have any already deformed bones, your lower leg bone is bent. And as you said, the body doesn't like, the bone doesn't like bending and tension. When the bone is bent, the con uh, vex side is under retention and is likely to keep bending. So if you have any uh, deformed bones, those are on protected areas. They're at risk to keep bending. Those I would follow. How often? It depends on what the history is. If you've had a hip that you've uh, has a little bit of bend in it and you followed it every year for four or five years, hasn't had any change, you're an adult, you're done growing, then probably you can start to back it out to longer times and stuff. Some people have been recommended to have a yearly bone scan to see if the disease is active. Um, not sure what the ordering physician meant by that. If you're getting micro fractures, they say, well, we have to pick up micro fractures. Micro fractures, they're going to hurt. And so that goes back to the first one up there. If you're having symptoms, get it evaluated. If you, if, uh, uh, you have uh, at risk areas, um, then I again would manage that based upon symptoms. And uh, at risk areas, it'd be easier to pick up any activity on a plain film than a bone scan or anything like that. And for the at risk areas, uh, I'd rather treat them before they fracture, get rid of the at risk thing, reinforce them. Then, then you don't have to worry about them. So I'm not sure with the, the yearly uh, bone scan, uh, I'm not sure why they were recommending that, but must have had a reason of, of some sorts. Um, Getting into another topic that's brought up, Mazabrod's syndrome. This is fibrous dysplasia with associated intramuscular myxoma. An intramuscular myxoma is just a mucousy, snotty type tumor in the muscle. And actually, my understanding is that Mazabrod syndrome was initially described the other way, in that they would notice these uh, myxomas and in evaluating them find fibrous dysplasia, which they hadn't been uh, aware of. Um, the myxoma led to the discovery of the fibrous di dysplasia. Um, the uh, concern was, is this just a happenstance, or is there a relationship? And they have isolated the uh, uh, GS alpha mu mutation from the cells in the myxoma. I'm, I'm not aware of which cell line. I don't know if you know which, but uh, yeah. So it is a genetically associated condition. Um, the management of these is with the fibrous dysplasia. You manage it like any other fibrous di dysplasia. If it's an at-risk area, if it's symptomatic, rot it. Uh, if, uh, if it's not, you just watch it. Uh, if the management of the myxoma again, is on a symptomatic basis, if it's limiting your muscle function, it's too big, you can't get your pants on, is on sightly, uh, it's causing you any sorts of concerns, and you just excise it. Uh, as I tell my patients, if they have a bump or a mass like that that isn't bothering them, give it a name and play with it. <laughs> now, the last thing is that having fibrous dysplasia doesn't exempt you from the other ravages of the earth orbiting the sun, okay, years. Uh, you're still prone to heart issues, lung issues, arthritis in other joints, the uh, elderly aches and pains, cataracts, uh, uh, etc. But here's a chance to actually take advantage of your fibrous dysplasia. You know, I'd like to go to the gym with you, play a couple hours of the basketball, jog a few miles, uh, it's not that I'm 40 years too old or 60 pounds uh, overweight. It's uh, the fibrous dysplasia. That's it. Okay. <laughs> While you're out, give me a six-pack of beer. So anyway, uh, fibrous dysplasia will continue into adulthood because bones continue to grow. And the management basically is the same as Dr. Stanton <laughs> talked about in the kids. Thanks. Yep. Oh, yes, you can.
Dr. Paul is a physiatrist, uh, not to be confused with a psychiatrist. <laughs> Podiatrist. <laughs> so these are the guys who are going to have to help me out with the patients who are patients. A lot of experience in taking care of patients. So why is it we try to do fibrous dysplasia? Because I think, like Dr. Stanton, uh, over time learned a lot just in seeing these patients and taking care of these patients. And as soon as he is set up, Am I working? Am I good? Am I on? Am I on? Okay. Well, I'll wait and make sure those people on the outside uh, can hear us too. Uh, some of you have heard this at least once or twice. Some of you have heard it personally from me. And uh, so for you guys, since this is a rerun, you can help. I mean, it's Sunday. Now, I was in synagogue yesterday, and you guys are here instead of church, so maybe we can have a little call and response. If you know the answer, say it out loud. And that means somebody learned something, which would be good. And, and Mike, I don't think I need the stickball bat unless somebody brought a Spalding ball, and then we can play stickball afterwards. Uh, but anyhow, I want to thank, I, I want to thank the, the committee, the advisory board, the wonderful people I get to work with at NIH, and uh, also the wonderful orthopedist who spoke before me. As Mike said, I'm not an orthopedist. I am a physiatrist, and you probably wonder what that is. He made it clear, it's not a podiatrist, it's not a psychiatrist, so don't tell me about your toenails or your crazy aunt in the basement. <laughs> So Lynn let, finished with, uh, with Gary Trudeau's impression of surgeons, but fortunately, uh, Gary actually went to the old Walter Reed, and he observed my colleagues there and uh, plotted out a series of, 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 uh, of one of his main characters recovering from a traumatic injury from, uh, from the war in Iraq. And uh, so he had to explain what we were, and I think that's probably the best explanation I've ever seen for us who are sort of the, uh, the Rodney Dangerfield of medical specialties. No one knows what we are and we don't get any respect. <laughs> but the important thing is, and the important thing in this case is going to be, and I have the same caveat everybody else does, is don't take what I said itself. C-Y-L-P. Consult your local medical rehabilitation professionals before you go off and say, oh, he was funny. Maybe he knows something. I should listen to him. Uh, but the point is, so, the, so my goal today is to make you a better consumer of rehab services, an informed consumer. Once upon a time, there was an awesome clothing store on the East Coast called Sims, where they said an educated consumer is our best customer. An educated patient, an educated family member advocate is the best customer of successful function when you have a bone disease like fibrous dysplasia. So hopefully I'll make you a better customer. And what I am, more than anything, is the guy who can talk to these guys in their language, talk to rehab professionals in their language, and hopefully be able to see both of it and serve sort of as your orchestra conductor or your quarterback in an excellent, hopefully excellent team of rehabilitation professionals. If there isn't one of, if there isn't a physiatrist around, then choose the medical specialist who's closest to that and has the most interest and help them be the physiatrist pro tem. Okay, now I'm going to tell you stuff that most of you already know. So what's the problem? I mean, you know, so you have these things in your bone. And they'll fix it eventually. <laughs> but maybe we could try to present, prevent some of this malalignment. Keep it from getting to bony deformities. If it is at a bony deformity, the classic one you've seen multiple <laughs> pictures of, maybe we can get you back and moving better and slow the progression. And the spine is an issue. Everybody's referenced the article Allison's taken the lead on. And, and the spine is an issue, is it an issue because everything else is off kilter? We're not sure about all those things yet, but we need to address that. And one of the things that you can sometimes address without <coughs> surgery is leg length discrepancy. So I'm going to talk about, and fractures, we also talked about that. All these things, what happens now? It hurts. You're weak. You can't move. <coughs> you can't move. 
Now you move less. Now you use Lynn's excuse not to go to the gym, not even to go to the swimming pool, which he can do. <laughs> you set me up, man. That's what I said. <laughs> play basketball. <laughs> he can't play basketball. He can't go to the pool. So, so what? You know, you can still, you know, in North Carolina, they have drive throughs for, for beer and wine. You don't even have to get out of the car. You can still get your six-pack. So, so why do you care? But walking and mobility is important. And there's simple things that we all have to do, whether we like it or not. We have to get up. We have to dress. We have to bathe. We have to toilet. And then there's the things you might want to do, you know, and those things that you have to do on a higher level. Homemaking, school work, you know, all aspects of life can be affected by, and I'm telling people who understand this better than I do, a condition which involves all your bones and your endocrine system often as well. So what do we do in physical medicine and rehab that helps? What I will say is that one of the reasons some people don't understand what we are is because we don't own an organ system. These guys are the bone doctors. He's the endocrine doctor. We're the doctors who look at people's function. A lot of times we know more about muscle than other people because muscle moves you around, but we're the doctors who are concerned with making people who have a disability and or pain, which is a disability, as functional as possible. So physical medicine is a toolkit of, of interventions that can be used for rehabilitation, which is a process. You're here now, you want to get there later, or you want to keep from going down there later. So what's a process we can do? You know, it's this, this three apples there. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. You, if we can keep you away from me, we can even keep you away from those guys longer. So that's the three apples. <laughs> so what do we do? What's the concept in rehab? So first of all, we try to prevent or minimize an impairment. An impairment could be the shepherd's crook. Impairment can be a loss of mobility. In and of itself, it might not matter, except if you don't do it, you lead to disabilities. Disabilities are things that you want or have to do, like walk across the room, form a complete sentence, wipe your butt, all these things. So we, sometimes, if it's not broken, we won't fix it yet. Sometimes even when it is broken, we can't fix it, and so we have to compensate for it and give you other ways. You know, get later, we're going to talk about there's an app for that. <laughs> and even, I guess I'm using an apple for a change. I have to say that. By the way, just this, my disclosure, I work for the NIH. They don't let me own anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, but the key is, well, how do we get there? We, with, well, I like to annoy medical students every once in a while because they figure rehab's so easy. It's not, you don't have to be so smart to be in rehab. So I'll ask them questions like, tell me the normal range of values of the blood rehab titer. See, Bob and Lynn know the normal <laughs> range of values for that because they know it doesn't exist. <laughs> you, can't, you can take a blood test to figure out if your urinary tract infection is better uh, or urine test would be a better idea, in fact. You can't take a blood test to see if rehab's effective. All we can say is, based on what we understand about physics and science and math and the little bit of research we've been able to do on function, that this is what's most likely the right approach. And then we say, we want to get there in a month. Did we get there? Good. Are we on our way to getting where we wanted to get to in a year? If in a month we didn't get to where we got, did we do something wrong? Did we do too little, too much, do the wrong thing? And it's this constant feedback loop that you have to do. That's why you need a team. It can't be one person. It can't be just a physical therapist, an occupational therapist. It can't be just a physician. You have to have a team. And the interesting thing about that team is, if you think of it as a, a symphony orchestra, where everybody's playing together, guess what's different? You're not a professional musician, but you're on that orchestra. In fact, you're probably the most important part of that orchestra. So make sure they're setting goals. And then we use this physical medicine toolkit to get to where we're getting. So here's the concepts. If you go away, if you take away just with this one, and by the way, those who have seen this before, this is the one bit of extra I added to the slide. We want you to be straight, if possible, or as straight as possible, supple as possible, in other words, as flexible as possible. I, I want to do alliteration, so I couldn't just say flexible. It didn't work. Uh, though S's and F's are related, especially when you dictate and they make your F into an S and things like that. We want you to keep strong as possible, and safe as possible. 
So the, the, what, the motivating theories, the motivating concepts behind the goals that are to be set are supple, straight, strong, and most importantly safe, and using techniques that will get you there. Whether it's stuff we're doing before they get to you, stuff they're doing and we're doing after that, that's the idea. So, what do we do to reduce the impairments so you have less disabilities? The most important one is this scary chemical called dihydromonoxide. Anybody who hasn't heard the talk before, <laughs> can, they, can you show me an example of dihydromonoxide? Yes, it came from Giant. <laughs> I use the same thing in bigger bottles to brew my beer. <laughs> so I don't trust Montgomery County water. So water is dihydromonoxide. Why is water the secret to success, or a secret to success? And I don't get any money from the Washington Sanitary Sewer Commission, so it's not, I'm not pushing their water, or, or any of those other waters that are bottled from a tap and sold for a lot of money. Uh, water gives you buoyancy. So you, it helps support you if you're weak. Water gives you shock absorption when you have not so hot bone. And if you're in a nice warm pool, it's going to relieve some of the pain. Finally, you have to push yourself through the water. Uh, those of us who are currently regarded as able-bodied, that's what people in the disability call, call, call those of us, because eventually we will be, at least temporarily. So us crabs, next time you're at the beach or you're at a pool, walk a lap. See how easy that is. It's not. You're pushing through the resistance of the water. So, so uh, this is why water is a wonderful place when you have a bone disease. <coughs> OK, so. It's, that's why I said it's not just swimming. You don't have to swim. You can. That's great. But you can do upright activities so long as you're up high enough to get the resistance. So water should be your friend from the time you have a diagnosis. And warm is what we like because warm gives you the opportunity to have some pain relief on top of everything else as opposed to freezing and, and not concentrating and getting your muscles and joints stiff. So this is the idea. I've already said it. So I'll say it again. Health and mobility, strength, endurance, and pain. It's a good thing. And if you can't find a pool, so if you're, if you're lucky, you have a pool in your neighborhood that you can take, go to that's covered even in the wintertime if it's cold. But depending on your size, you can even do some of this stuff in a hot tub. The little babies, you could even do some of this in the, in, the, in the bathtub. So there's options. OK, leg length discrepancy. You have a condition that affects long bones. And uh, we had a little brief discussion on what does it mean to really have a leg length discrepancy. And, and we, none of us really have a great research foundation for what we're going to say. But I'll at least give you a logical reason for what we do at NIH. And I don't care if one leg's longer than the other, as much as what happens when you're moving and walking. Oh, I'm going to do what I'm supposed, not supposed to do. I have to stay here. So here's feet. Feet are moving. And they're standing. If I'm standing like this, and I'm standing like this for a long time, lots of things are going to hurt, and, and things are going to be off balance and off pressure. Oh, now I'm going to go back here. It's going to mess him up. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> if you're walking, and you're walking off kilter, as, as my esteemed orthopedic colleague said, you're walking on your feet. The science of the physics of walking is you push down on the world, the world pushes down on you with equal force. That's why the world doesn't throw you up in the air and you don't push the world down unless you're walking on sand, of course. So that force is balanced, but that force expresses itself in torques, in rotary forces around your joints. And the amount of force that's going around your joints is this much plus this much, and it's on an angle. So it's two, when one foot's on the ground and the other isn't, the force that your joints are feeling in rotation is two and a half times your body weight. So if you're getting it asymmetrically, that's probably not a good idea either. So we want to keep you level. Uh, we also want to consider 
what's causing that leg length discrepancy. So, and, 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 and a subset of people with fibrous dysplasia, we notice that they also have loose rubber band tissues. The collagen, which is what makes up ligaments and tendons, is loose. So you have bone that's at risk and, and, and loose ligaments that are putting you at a funny angle and then putting forces through the, through the joints and through the, the lung, the shafts of the bones in ways that will cause bending that they have to fix. So what can we do to fix this? We can do things that are fairly simple and hopefully keep you from the little staples at the, at the, at the physis if you're a growing kid. And you do things like, and again, remember CYLP. Don't just go out and do this because I said so. Uh oh, I got to get moving. Ten minutes to go. Uh, you need to talk to your own people. You can put a shoe insert in. You can align the bone. If all you have is a difference of up to three-eighths of an inch li difference inside your shoe, and you have a properly structured shoe, you can level yourself by just having a little shoe lift in the shoe. And if you walk more evenly, that'll probably help. Uh, if, if the feet are flat, forces are going through in, in an undesirable way. You've lost the strap comes over your arch. So support that. We can get into the inside baseball of how that should be done in another time, individual questions. And then if it's more than three-eighths of an inch, you just can't stick it in the shoe because then your heel's going to be coming out the back of the shoe. So it has to be built into the, the midsole of the shoe. And so here's a place where you can get some information, but I'm going to have to keep on going. Now alignment. Why is it my alignment? It may be the fibrous dysplasia itself. It may be because the joints are lax, as I said. How can you help the laxity? You can strengthen, you're not going to change the, the character of those rubber bands. If those rubber bands are loose, they're loose. We don't have the technology to fix that. But we can make it stronger so that you pull harder and you compensate for the loose rubber bands. And you can sometimes hold things in the right direction with braces. So they might slow malalignment, and that might slow some of the other things we don't like. Bony deformities. You've heard what we think this is. It may be the bone geometry and the bone physiology. It may also be the way it's taking the, the stress of weight bearing. And so what can we do to try to help that before you have to go to surgery? We can offload. That's what a, uh, an assisted by a cane or a walker does. We can put a brace on to hold things in the right, right angle, and we can keep you more even. So joint mobility, why, why don't you have enough mobility? Is it a loss? Is it related to the bone itself? That you're not going to do too much. But if you've got secondary tightness, the opposite of what I'm talking about, you're not moving your joints enough, and now the ligaments and tendons have gotten tight, you can do something about that. As I said, bone, you're not going to fix with rehab. Bone, you fix with a bone doctor. But if it's Elastic tissues, you can, you can work on that. Again, just don't go out and start stretching yourself. Make sure you've you learned how to stretch in the right way. Fractures. We can try to prevent things by keeping the body balanced and the forces balanced and supporting the bones with strong muscles. We can reduce the impact of the fracture later on by getting you up as soon as possible, as Dr. Stanton mentioned. And don't let other things get tight, contracted, and weak when you weren't moving around. So we don't want to create one problem when we fix another one. And don't, that's what I said. Okay, so muscle weakness. It can be due to those things that we already talked about. So find out why it's weak and think, you have a plan to fix it. Then do it gradually and keep in mind you're trying to strengthen muscle that's attached, to, that, that's going to be attached to bone it may not be the happiest bone in the world. So be careful how you strengthen that muscle. The last thing you want to do is break the bone because you've got to, you just to make a strong muscle. So strengthening requires contraction against a force, and you have to know your limits, as I've already said. Deconditioning means you've lost endurance, OK? And you have a vicious cycle of immobility. And all those things I talked about can cause that. So you have to gradually increase your activity level, do more. You gotta get your heart pumping. That's what aerobic exercise is. That's what affects the conditioning. And it's good for your heart and lungs because we said we all get older and you want to work on that. Again, dihydroin oxide is your friend. Swimming, water aerobics, other things that can work. Walking, if you can't. Wheeling, if, you're, if, you're, if you're mo your way of getting around the world is you know, in a wheelchair, use your manual wheelchair, push. Go around the neighborhood, go up hills. Cycle, hand cycle, uh, recumbent cycle, 
static cycle, if you're worried about falling off the cycle, that's another thing that's going to give you nice loading without banging on yourself. Scooting. If you're, the only thing you could do is get around scooting your butt. So scooting your butt from room to room to room and get a little strength that way. If all you can do is roll, roll. So there's the, we, we think maybe wind instruments might help with lung function if you have that issue, but that's only if you like music. And again, consult your local <laughs> professional. Pain. We had a whole discussion on this yesterday, which I missed, but keep in mind that pain can, if you know what the source of the pain is, that may be the best way to get rid of the pain, rather than just treat the symptom of pain. And even when you do that, things like heat modalities can help, heat and cold, things like TENS can help, massage can help, so relaxation can help, because as Lynn mentioned, Dr. Lynn mentioned, the, the organ of pain is the brain. So all of you now with these horribly painful glasses that you didn't have 20 <laughs> minutes ago, understand that it's not the glasses causing the pain, it's the brain causing the pain. Acupuncture can work too sometimes. Local injections, if you have the right thing. All right, now let's talk about the disabilities in the little bit of time we have left. And so I like to throw a cartoon in just to give me a chance to breathe, and sometimes people even laugh at them. So walking. You have orthotics, we talked about that. You have different assistive devices that can help. And this is one thing where we actually have a little bit of research proof. I won't read the whole thing, but we actually sat down and we went through all of our patients, five minutes or, uh, 10 and minutes, oh, I thought 10 minutes before. No, it's for 10. Oh, okay, good. Okay. You get a bonus. Oh, I get a bonus, 10 uh, Now, you had a good joke. I'll you stop a talking like a New Yorker. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, keep it going. Okay. Well, I wasn't talking like one really before anyhow, so it's okay. Uh, so anyhow, uh, this is something we actually have looked at. We've looked at the degree, the degree of disease burden, people's flexibility, people's strength, and causation, uh, and, and I have to say correlation does not prove causation, but we have noticed that those people who are strong and flexible at their hips and are balanced in their leg length, seem to be able to walk for longer and walk faster and further. So we don't know if that's why they walk better, but at least it's an area that you can look at and try to work on and make a difference. So this is, this is the petting zoo of assistive devices that you can have. Various types of crutches, various types of walkers, depending on what your needs are, with and without <laughs> wheels, with support for your arms if you need it, and uh, sometimes with seats, and sometimes with wheels, and they can haul one of your legs up. The last one is really used only short uh, you know, short for short indications, but if you need help and you can walk, use it. People don't want to wear use a cane or a walker, because, oh, it makes me look like an old granny. <laughs> well, eventually, hopefully, you will be one, and, and you'll, be, you'll have a better chance of doing that if you stay exercising. And second of all, all of you people with those horrible, painful glasses are not taking them off just because they may look good or not. Uh, you want to be able to see. So walking is the same thing. Canes and other assistive devices are glasses for your feet. And then there's logical ways of doing things. This is called energy conservation work simplification. Do it easy. If you can sit to do things, don't blow your whole wad on getting dressed in the morning. Sit if you can. Think, keep things close to each other. Don't go like I do something back and forth to the closet, to the dresser, back and forth, back and forth. I can get away with that, but if you don't have a lot of energy, get it all out at once, put it next to the bed, then sit down, get it on, and you haven't, you haven't now gotten dressed and thinking you a nap. Okay, and that means planning. And in all these things, Physics has been your enemy, but make physics your friend. Slide instead of lift when you can, and use good body mechanics. Put the work at the right height, and use equipment that helps, adaptive equipment. Now here's the question, if you're using wheels to get around, what's the advantage of manual? It's lighter, it's easier to move around, it's a source of exercise. If you're in between, so you can't get up the hills, but you still want to use manual, this thing called power assist wheels, 
and you put it on a regular chair, it makes it a little heavier, and you push and it helps you push. But it's better to get around with power than not get around at all. And you can get things that recline the back if you need to rest your back, to lower you to the ground, to raise you up. Though the, having both in one chair is harder to find these days. And some may even stand you up. And that, and that can even interface with your, uh, your, your internet of things home. So what about things you need to do? Here we go. No stock in Apple, but there is an app for doing different things. And you should know they are. Yeah. You should know there are things that can help you do stuff. You don't have to struggle. You can have something as simple as a sponge on a stick. Or on a stick. And that'll help you do what you need to do in the bathtub without falling down. Sitting might not be a bad idea either. Different types of chairs. And some that even bring you up and down. Some that you can take to the beach, sort of. But they're, those are ones for kids. And if you put them on the high legs, then you have to lift your kid out of the tub anymore. Grab bars so you can step in and out without slipping and falling and breaking your fibrous displacer bone. These guys have enough work to do. They don't have to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning on Saturday to take care of what you did because you, you, were, you weren't being careful in the bathroom. And this is an example of an adapted bathroom with all these sort of things. And enough space that if you're in a wheelchair, you'll be able to move around. What about toileting? So it, it's easier to get up. Maybe you need it at your bedside. You don't have to go as far. Maybe you need to seat a little higher. Maybe you need some arms to help you get up and down. Maybe you have limited mobility in your upper limbs and you can't reach to wipe yourself. But there are apps even for that. Don't just say, oh, this sucks. I can't do anything. Ask your local professional. Or even better than that, you can go to a website called Able Data and you can see everything that's out there. Not all of it's going to be right for you, but at least you can ask the professional, hey, would this work? Dressing. Handy dandy things to get buttons on when you have trouble doing buttons. To pull your zipper up. To get your socks on. To get, the, to get your shoe on. Elastic laces so you don't have to tie the shoe, but you can still get on a good structured shoe instead of a croc. <laughs> and what my wife used to tell her burn patients when she was an occupational therapist so they would use it you can get a long handled nurse pincher <laughs> to pick things up do not pinch the nurses you'll be on the front cover of some newspaper with some guy named Weinstein <laughs> okay you, if you insist on using toothpaste from a tube and not the liquid stuff like I do because it's easier, you can get stuff to squeeze the toothpaste out of the tube. You can get stuff to hold the toothbrush and tooth the toothpaste on. You can get long handle brushes and combs. You can get grips that'll help you hold the toothbrush, the toothpaste, <coughs> your fork, your spoon, something that'll even hold your hair dryer in a like, oh, Something that'll even hold your hair dryer on the wall so you don't have to hold that. And then for eating, <coughs> built up grips, cups with easier grips, this stuff called Dyson, which is sort of like Rubbermaid stuff, or anybody's brand stuff that you put in your, in your drawers that's sort of sticky and tacky and keeps things from slipping. You can get a little vice grip cutting board so you only need one hand to cut things. You can get really cool things that open different types of containers. And then what about getting around, getting in the house? You can get door <laughs> openers, reachers, we already talked about, rolling carts, or if you're from Europe, trolleys. So you can push around a cart. So you get everything on the cart, and then push the cart over to the table. Put your food down. So you're not carrying this one here and that one there. Stair lifts, if you need. You can talk to an architect who has a knowledge of the disability standards you can get a ramp to get you in and out of your, out of your house. That ramp should have an incline of no, no more than 1 to 12, 1 foot or one, or 1 meter for every 12 feet or 12 meters of rise, of run. Because otherwise, it's going to be real hard to push yourself up there. And you're going to be sliding down really fast. 1 to 12. The ratio is 1 to 12, whatever you want to use as your, uh, your standard of measurement. Open up the doorways, at least 36 inches wide. Lower your cabinets. Use lowered counter heights. 
countertop light. And there's also certain really cool things like you can get these that, that are made now because they're really hip and nice and fancy. Like your dishwasher can be in a drawer, and you can get a oven, a wall oven, that opens out this way and sort of down like that way in your wheelchair. You can't reach the damn cookies. <laughs> Which might not be a bad idea. You shouldn't be. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Headsets for your telephone. So you're not going like this and messing up your spine. There's all sorts of different things that are, that are adapted for writing. Scissors, letter openers, workstations and chairs that are ergonomic. If you can't write or type, voice recognition software. And there is something called the Activities with Disabilities Act. I know I'm coming down to the stretch. I see here I have one minute and 10 seconds left to go. You, are, you have a right to reasonable accommodations under the Americans with Disabilities Act. At work and in school, you have a right to educationally relevant specialized services. So fun and fitness, don't forget that. There's adaptive equipment for needle crafts, for card games, for gardening tools and supports, and there's all sorts of organizations that, that do adaptive sports. All right. I took out the last joke because <laughs> I was worried I would be out of time. But again, I want to thank, thank, thank the, the organizers, the board, and thank you for your time. Yeah. What? Because they either have estrogen or testosterone poisoning. Uh, but uh, I, I'm on here, oh, I think, sorry. right? We don't want to. No, like, well, yeah. I, you I, should I, be on here, too. Sorry. I, 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 are you guys getting me? I don't want to be on 12 mics. There's a little bit of a delay. I don't know if you've seen me clap when nobody else has. <laughs> uh, well, I, if this is working, do you want me to use this one? You're good. Okay. Sorry. All right. So, so motivating teenagers is a challenge in general. Uh, <clears throat> I think that. Uh, it's probably in some ways a better question for a psychiatrist or a psychologist <laughs> than it is for a physiatrist. But I will say that they're not, they, they might not see the, the big picture. But if you can get them to take the first step to do something that you think might help and you make it enjoyable for them in some way, or you make it work into their life, or best of all, if you can figure out a way and with social networking and all that sort of stuff now, that you can generate peer pressure so that you have another teen telling them, dude, do it. You know, uh, or, or say if this is a 14 year old and an 18 year old on a, on, on a discussion site can say, man, I wish I had just gotten in the pool two times a week and then I wouldn't have had to do this, that, or the next thing. Uh, but so peer pressure helps. Uh, focusing on short things and taking it apart choosing your battles, finding some sort of an incentive that works for them, that's what I would say are the best shots you have. And it's like the challenge any other parent has. Okay, thank you. Here's uh, two requests, two questions that, that are, are, are related. I'm going to try and contract them into one. And it has to do with uh, distinguishing fibrous dysplasia from osteogenesis imperfecta and the confusion between the two, and is it possible to have both? I mean, one of the things I can say is there's genetic testing for both of these. Right. With, with um, osteogenesis imperfecta, it's a germline mutation, so you can check the blood. So, so that's simple. Uh, I guess it's theoretically possible to have both, but I think exceedingly unlikely. Yeah, I, I don't recall um, ever seeing anybody that had both diseases. And in general, uh, before the genetic testing was around, uh, radiographs are fairly characteristic of each disease. So um, I, I don't really see that 
that a qualified professional would have too much trouble telling the difference between those two conditions if if you're um, you have a family member where the diagnosis is in doubt you really probably need a different doctor yeah. <laughs> they don't look the same they don't act the same yeah, yeah. Here's, here's four related questions on aneurysmal bone cysts and, and I'll just try and go through all of them and you guys can take them on um, let's see uh, do bone cysts, aneurysmal bone cysts bleed and show bruises on the skin? No. No, okay. What percent of patients with fibrocytosis will get ABCs? Wow. Um, I would say 12, 15%, maybe, maybe higher. I think if you have bad F, if yeah. a group of patients with bad FD, maybe 10%, all comers, maybe 1%. That's yeah. a minority. Yeah. Uh, any way to prevent ABCs? No. 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 Um, the warning signs of ABC's coming. Well, um, it's a lot easier in the skull because you can feel a bump coming up on your head, and a lot of my patients have had that um, in a you know two-month period or it's five-week period. The bump comes up. It's a little harder when it's a deep bone like the femur. Um, and it, most of the time, it's in someone whose x-rays have been relatively stable for a while. And then over a seven, ten-week period, they start having a lot more pain than they used to. And uh, you have to look at the x-ray and be, you have to have a high index of suspicion. Yeah, like anything, it's the, for the change. You know you're sick this morning because something's different, okay? Mm -hmm. And the same thing with the ABC. It's something's different now than a couple of weeks ago. Pain, x-ray change over a month. Yeah, and this last one, uh, I think you guys covered it. What was that? Um, <coughs> Scott Paul, a lot of physical therapists are afraid of FD patients and don't know what to do to treat these patients. Is there a place, site, info resource to point them to? Uh, at the risk of getting too many emails, I'll say that uh, that we are a source of knowledge at, at the NIH, and uh, uh, I, I can field some of those, and, and our physical therapists in the Rehabilitation Medicine Department at the Clinical Center at NIH probably have more experience in kids with fibrous dysplasia and adults with fibrous dysplasia than most people do, and they're willing to answer questions. Uh, we do want to respect people's uh, privacy, so we will not answer questions from physical therapists about a specific patient without the permission of the person or their parent, depending on what their age is, and so usually in those cases we, we prefer uh, that the therapists question be forwarded through the person and their family. Uh, again, another ABC. What are the risks of an ABC in the skull? Depends um, where it is. I, uh, yeah. Most of the time, the ABCs in the skull are in the per periphery where you can see, touch, or feel mm -hmm. on physical exam. Um, I have heard of them expanding interiorly, and but I've not heard of anyone having any severe neurologic compromise from that? Yeah, we, we've had a couple patients in whom that has actually occurred. Okay. Where just by bad luck, the ABC occurred near where the optic nerve was. And again, hey. these things happen quickly. These happen over days. So one day uh, you're watching TV and you're fine. The next day you, you can't see out of this eye. So, and those are the sorts of things that require immediate attention. Um, is it possible to replace a bone with a long bone from a, a donor cadaver. So I reckon like replace the whole femur with a cadaver bone. Yeah, so uh, that actually is, you know, if you're talking about bone grafts, um, that's a, a what we call a, a, a giant allograft. And um, those actually can endure for years because you're taking the entire fibrous dysplastic bone out mm -hmm. and you're throwing that away and replacing it with a cadaver allograft. And so the, the fibrous dysplasia is, is gone and it's not there to eat away your bone graft. But giant allografts like that also have some um, dangers to them and, and occasional patients will resorb those very quickly as well. But but not so much. I did a lot of those for tumor work. Um, besides just um, fibrous dysplasia, I take care of lots of other tumors. And uh, I have used uh, giant allografts on a number of occasions, and it is possible. But that's really down the line when, when so many other things you've tried haven't worked, 
that can be an option. And I have also replaced entire femurs with a whole big chunk of metal. It, and and it, it is possible, but should never, ever be very uh, high on your list. It should be way at the bottom. Um, another question sort of related. Is synthetic bone graft material better than cadaveric bone graft material? Um, I've only seen maybe two or three people that have had the synthetic bone graft material put in, and um, it did not fare any better than real bone graft. Lynn, have you again, seen that? Uh, yeah. Again, if you go back to the physiology of fibrous dysplasia, anything that stimulates bone healing uh, will make the FD worse. Okay. As I explained in one of the talks at one time, bone grafting of any sorts doesn't cure FD. It just pisses it off. <laughs> okay. And the same thing, the, the synthetic bone grafts are meant to be a scaffolding and in some cases a stimulant for new bone to grow in. The problem with bone grafting is the surrounding in tumors, you get rid of the tumor, the bone around the tumor is normal. And so you get normal bone growing in. With FD, you take that out, but the bone around still has FD in it. Okay, so it tends to grow in. So there's a number of questions here, like this one, that, that are, are relatively specific to a certain case. And so I think it's going to be hard to give a specific answer. But I think everyone here has also offered their services to give specific advice if you're contacted personally and the x-rays are sent, et cetera. But I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, would you recommend surgery in a preschooler with FDMAS that has filled the entire femur with extreme weakness in the femoral neck but has not yet compromised the cortex? Um, I, I, I tend to um, pick the neck shaft angle than anything else. Okay, if the femur is full of fibrous dysplasia and it's a lot fatter than it's supposed to be and it looks really ugly, uh, that's not an indication for me to jump in and do surgery. If the neck shaft angle is dropping down uh, or the frequent fractures, then that's the stimulus for Instruction. And this is a, a similar question related. You covered some of this in your talk, but that's okay. Uh, how do you make a determination of when to operate on the bone of a child? Would you wait for the break or fracture or insert beforehand to prevent the fracture? It's each bone lesion that has is each bone lesion that has FD guaranteed to worsen as the bones grow? Is there a risk that operating on a bone would make a child uh, potentially worse and that would have not progressed. So in other words, the crystal ball. Yeah, I'll take that, that last part first, okay. Um, there's, in many conditions, including lots of the cancers that I take care of, there's this misperception that, you know, the cancer is going to grow faster after it's biopsied. And uh, the fibrous displays is going to grow faster after it's operated on. <sighs> think that there's any scientific However, um, you don't do surgery until it's necessary. If it's necessary, it's necessary. And um, again, I tend to recommend surgery for small children when the be worried. Not so much the amount of disease, um, and occasionally it's the frequency of fracture, but, but most often it's the upper femur deformity that leads me to recommend surgery. Yeah. I just wanted to make two comments, one related to that, and I think Dr. Boyce can uh, support this as well. We have had children with fibrous dysplasia, in the long bones in particular, who when we first look at them, our prediction is, oh, they're going to do horribly, and some of them, most of them do, but some of them don't. Some of them don't. Some we think they're not going to have such a bad course, and they have a worse course than you think, and we don't know why that is and don't know how to pre predict it. In regard to your comment about regrowth with surgery, I think that we do have some evidence to support this in terms of the craniofacial fibrous dysplasia, that especially in growing children, that there does tend to be uh, exuberant regrowth uh, after surgery, and we, we've published this. So, but again, I think this speaks to differences in the, the long bones versus the craniofacial bones that we don't have a great handle on. Picking up on that a little bit, um, if just putting a rod inside the bone, uh, like we did on that shin bone, up there shouldn't stimulate healing. You're just putting a rod down the 
inside. Yeah, there's a little healing around the incisions in the bone and stuff. Uh, and that's why I'm more of a believer in prophylactic ro rotting, where you don't have to straighten them, get the rot in. Because as soon as you start to straighten them, do osteotomies. Then you're creating an injury that the body has to heal. That will stimulate the FD more. So I just, if you can get them rotted where you can just protect the bone and don't have to osteotomize them, I think you're less likely to have that. And the final comment, I think that is important. Keep the, the term in, yeah. I, I, you have to realize that for the upper femur in a four-year-old, there is no not available for that child. Mm -hmm. So you have to make something up and to make something up that's less than ideal no progressive deformity seems to me a bit um, uh, aggressive. Yeah. Here's two questions for you, Dr. Lindemann. Um, one, how long does it take for an adult with, an, with FD to recover after a rotting operation? And two, not related, but did you try bisphosphonates? Why or why not? Yes, I'm, I've, I've been on bisphosphonates about 10 years, and uh, they seem to help the leg pain. Uh, I am starting to get some atypical fractures in my feet, in case why I'm limping more up here. That also could be just getting old. Uh, but uh, as far as recovery from rotting, if there's no uh, osteotomies, uh, soft tissue healing, bone healing can take up to six weeks, etc. That's why I like to do a rotting that is stable so they can walk on it immediately and we get them back up and get them weight bearing uh, immediately on it because weight bearing down the length of the bone actually stimulates healing and uh, I let them back to uh, activities as quick as they possibly can realistically it's going to take them a couple weeks to get comfortable enough to get off crutches but the recovery is uh, if we get the bone stably rotted and supported just based upon the symptoms hopefully somewhere between two weeks and six weeks uh, they're they're back up kids they're back in school as soon as they're uh, able to get up and around with crutches and stuff how about FD in the spine uh, what does it lead to clinically what treatments exist for FD in the spine dr. Stanton pardon <laughs> I don't have to move it yeah oh, oh. Okay. Okay. So, um, <laughs> number one, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there is no specific treatment for FD of the spine itself. That is, you you can't take it out. You, you can't bone graft it. Uh, the only treatment is if the patient develops curvature that is worrisome, and by worrisome, I mean enough curvature that it's going to interfere primarily with lung function. Is what we're usually talking about. Cardio uh, uh, thoracic compromise from advancing scoliosis can lead to severe health problems. So we're not operating on people because they're crooked. We're operating on people because their spinal deformity is uh, impacting their health. And then they need a spine fusion. And we put instrumentation into the bones of the spine, um, trying to find the, the, the number of bones that are either not affected or minimally affected to use those for anchor points for the fixation device and staying away from the fibrous dysplasia. We don't, you know, we don't cure at or, or mess with the bones that have fibrous dysplasia. And then massive uh, bone grafts on the outside of the spine to achieve a spine fusion. Yeah. So you kind of bypass the bad parts. Um, there is one treatment available for uh, fibrous dysplasia before you have to get to the spinal surgery that they're doing at places like um, Shriners Hospitals and that is uh, TLSO bracing. Um, and it's preventing the, the curvature from getting too severe because the, the longer you can postpone the, the fusion, um, the better it is for growth. Uh, well, on that, on that note, I would say that um, when, when people do things and um, claim that, that they're making um, progress, or they need to prove it to me, okay? So I'm waiting to see a published study on conservative treatment of scoliosis in fibrous dysplasia in one of the peer-reviewed journals, and there is none. There's um, Shriners Hospital in Hamburg are working on one, yeah. um, so 
hopefully it will be out soon. Also, I, I, I want to interpret this a little bit as the, as, the, as the brace kind of guy, and that is that keep in mind the way turtle shell braces work in the spine is by putting pressure on the ribs and the pelvis to try to keep the spine from curving. So if you have FD in your ribs or your pelvis, you're going to be pushing on FD bone, yep. which may not like, mm -hmm. the, which number one, may not transmit the forces to help the spine, and maybe. Uh, not desirable, not give you a desirable result. So I think it's important again, CYLP. Some people may have a, a trunk that's amenable to those types of brace, to that type of bracing. Some may not. Uh, the only thing I say is if, if, if the pelvis is off kilter, level the pelvis so at least you don't have uh, a, a torque, a, a twisting moment that could exacerbate the spine curve. In another thing, un, not so much for scoliosis spine FD, but you know, it was thought for a long time that FD in the spine was rare, uh, and in fact, it's quite common. And in fact, we've been impressed with people with very significant fibrous dysplasia in their spine who don't get scoliosis and who don't have pain and who don't have neurologic. So, the presence of FD in the spine does not mean that a surgeon should go in and cut it out. You, you treat uh, patients, not x-rays, and, and so I think you, the presence of FD in the spine can just be a finding that may not have any consequences. Okay, uh, do ABCs typically occur at the site of a previous fracture? Is the pain of an ABC intermittent or constant? I'm not familiar with uh, any um, evidence that they occur in, in the site of a previous fracture. We've never seen that no. in the site of a fracture or a surgery, no. Okay. Uh, uh, are there any supplements that have shown promise with FD? <laughs> Stainless steel. Heal with steel. Common sense goes a long way. Calcium, vitamin D, exercise, uh, verified supplements that have been shown not to have weird stuff in them and that there's evidence that they don't cause harm because there are evidence that some supplements have contaminants and, and some supplements that have been studied uh, have shown harm. So I, I personally wouldn't do it if it's not yeah. safe, uh, but I don't know of any supplements otherwise. Mike, wouldn't you say if you can get that supplement in a good balanced diet that that might be a better solution? Yes, it, yeah. it, it's always better to get your, your calcium from your food than to take the supplement if you can get enough. Um, this is one. Uh, if FD ribs are removed, if FD ribs are removed, is recurrent pain still likely? Oh, I guess. So if you have rib pain and they take the rib out, is that going to take care of the pain? This patient is that already I've been taking ribs out. Now, the only thing ribs. I do with ribs is a nice barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, ribs. Um, I have infrequently operated on ribs. Um, uh, the thing with ribs is that they're they're kind of expendable. Okay, as long as you don't take too many out. What does that mean? It means that if you take out a fairly long segment of somebody's rib and throw it away. Uh, there's no major harm to the patient as long as you're not taking out three or four, you know, in a row. So when you have a rib that has fibrous dysplasia in it, and that seems to be the only problem, you can actually take that out com almost completely in a, what's called a subperiosteal manner. And the periosteum, which is the lining around the outside of the bone, it will regenerate a, a reasonably decent functional rib, even in an adult. So uh, if that's the only place you have a problem, you could make that go away with a rib resection. Uh, but usually people have lots of ribs involved. It's yeah. not usually one or two. So it's not very practical to try to get rid of them all that way. Yeah, we only have five minutes, but I think the, the rib pain is, is an important thing. This person said that they had five infusions within three years and they still have rib pain. That simply may not be enough of infusions. If I could use your case as an example, Wendy. Wendy has very significant rib disease. I would say the most significant rib disease I've ever seen. And in fact, uh, she required high doses of bisphosphonates for a long time. It relieved her rib pain. The caveat is she did develop osteonecrosis of the jaw. What Wendy has said to me in the past is that she felt that the pain relief that the that the price of the osteoporosis of the jaw was worth the pain relief. Do I have that accurately? Yeah, so she agrees. So 
five infusions in three years may not be enough. But again, this is an individualized case. It's hard to talk about it in general. We need more information. Yeah, yeah. No, and, I mean, that's the whole point with pain. You have to look at the whole thing. What other factors are involved that could be exacerbating that pain? How can you relieve that pain? Get a history of what that person's doing. Get a good pain history of when it hurts, what causes it to hurt, what causes it, what, what, what helps it feel to feel better, and do a comprehensive pain management program. Yes. Not just oh, there's there's uh, FD in the rib that must be the pain. That's right. So Dr. Boyce uh, talked about nerve blocks. Some people have found them effective. Mm -hmm. We've also recently had good experience with topical lidocaine patches. They work for some, but not for others. But I think there's something you try and yeah, see if they work. There's, there's also topical, topical creams which will contain more than lidocaine. They'll have ketamine in them. They'll have gabapentin in them. They'll have different non-steroidals in them that actually has been proven to penetrate through the skin. But this gets more almost into possibly the chronic pain thing, where even if you take the rib out, it's going to hurt because you're aware of every little nerve signal there. That's where the lidocaine uh, block is actually sort of a diagnostic thing. If you block the nerves on that rib and the pain's there, it's not the rib. And sometimes if you uh, distract the, the nerve, by doing things like uh, capsaicin cream, which is used for shingles pain, uh, mm -hmm. and is basically the, the essential oil in hot pepper. And you feel warmth instead of pain. So there's, it, it, but each of these are little things in the toolbox. You need somebody who's gonna look at you comprehensively and come up with a plan and try the different things in the toolkit. And that's where the physical therapy and rehab can help because it gets the body used to, oh, I'm getting a pain or getting a signal from this nerve, it's okay, by uh, the uh, desensitization. All right, this is our last question, and it's from Shelly Hebert, and I can't read it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it actually was more of a comment, and it was in regards to when we were talking about the spinal fusions, and when I was 14, they rebuilt my back, and they took one of my ribs, and they left it living, and they created a new spine for me, along with the fusion and the wiring, and my back has been wonderful. I don't have that problem because of that. So it was just more of a comment to, you know, like you were talking about the things that are available out there, you know, to do. Vascularized rib uh, um, strut grafting is generally uh, reserved for patients that have anterior column uh, compromise where the vertebral bodies in the front are collapsing and that puts the spinal cord at risk. And that may be why you had that. Um, without your x-rays, we can't really comment specifically about that. But there's very few people who have severe anterior column involvement. And, and to the best of my knowledge, no one in our study, or your study, sorry, has, um, she, gra study. she graciously put my name on this paper for a, a, a few time. minor comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but, but none of them presented with any neurologic compromise. So. Well, we're out of time, and I don't want Speedsy to get mad at me, so we're going to stop now. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.